Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin and I am not here with Teo Sabadia. He is gallivanting around the country, working sadly, but I have replaced Teos with two wonderful folks, Jason Ward and Dan Dillon. Jason, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, happy to be here. We can't replace Thanks, Teos, thanks so much for having us. Oh, I will replace Teos. Believe me, for, you know, <laughs> in, in hockey terms, it's a bag of pucks. Is that what it's called? But uh, but for now, I want you each to introduce yourself, uh, starting with Jason. Jason, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Jason Ward. I am operating out of Indianapolis, Indiana, home of Gen Con, which is the only reason I'm into gaming, I guess. Not really. Uh, I am one half of Accidental Cyclops Publishing, and there is nothing else relevant to speak on. Okay. Well, until later. Until later. Yeah. All right. And Dan, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Dillon. I'm a freelance game designer, uh, primarily working on Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. And uh, I was formerly a member of the D&D design team at Wizards of the Coast. True story. I, I saw I saw that. I was there. Mm -hmm. There's proof. You could say you were there. Well, uh, I want to thank you both for coming on the show. As normal, we're going to stick with our routine, which is the first segment we'll take uh, listener questions and we will do some news. And then we will kick over to our main topic today, which will build on last week's topic of world building. Yes, build on last week's topic of world building and talk about making actual mechanical rules to fit the world that you're creating. Because I think both of you have some good insight into that based on your previous work. So let's jump right into our listener corner, starting with Alan Tucker via our Patreon Discord, who says, what do you consider success in the RPG industry? Uh, have you achieved it? And if so, when? Uh, Jason, what do you think? As the least experienced and least successful of the three of us, I got to go <laughs> first. Uh, yeah, so I... I I take success in sort of two two realms, I suppose. The first is, am I successful at creating the thing that I'm proud of? And, uh, you know, am I getting commentary on it that I like? Does it feel like people are enjoying it? That kind of success, the kind that makes you makes you proud and wants, you want to keep designing, right? The probably more important type of success uh, to make sure that you're going to keep doing this work is the commercial success. And those two are often linked, but not always. You can have a commercially successful product that just really isn't well received and well reviewed, but it sold well. And you can have some very good games, many of which I own from Kickstarter and from you know bookstores that are not commercially successful. They maybe sold a thousand copies, but they're just really great games. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm new to the publishing industry. This is really my part-time job. I've been 20 years in the wrong career uh, so far, and I'm trying to make my way into this one. And we've had one successful project that was lucrative comparatively compared to what we expected. And that was the Real Thing RPG, which is based on Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, it did in two different Kickstarter campaigns about... 2200 backers and sold some more after that so it, it did pretty well nice. particularly for what i would consider a zine we yeah. marketed it as a zine and uh, sold it as a zine and it did very well uh, for us which allowed us to start moving into some other stuff and made me feel um i guess competent or confident enough to go in and start working on some bigger projects nice uh dan same question what what, what what's your opinion or definition of that success yeah, so so one definition of success doesn't work for me, much like Jason said, and I agree with with his, you know, basically sort of two pronged definition of it. Um, I want to make games that are played and used and not just read. So if people look at something that I've written and it just ends up on a shelf and they never really touch it again, I don't personally consider that a success, even if they enjoyed it, which I'm, I'm gratified for. Like, I'm happy if someone just reads it and enjoys it, but I want it to be played. I want it to hit the table. I want it to see you. So I want people to have fun with it. So that's, that's sort of my personal measure of a successful thing in the RPG mm. world. Um, Commercial yeah. success, you know, that's that's an ongoing thing. I, I don't think I'll ever be able to say, haha, now I've made it. You know, that's I, I freelanced for many, num many years, uh, you know, did the Wizards thing for a number of years. Now I've moved on from that. Uh, so there there really isn't a 
Uh, I've hit the bumper. Now I have, now I am successful. It's, it's uh, steps on a journey. Mm -hmm. And so I just keep sort of moving forward to the next thing and keep trying to do the next, the next cool project. Yeah. I, I have a feeling I, you, both your answers are, are great. <clears throat> excuse me, are great. So I'm going to go, I'm going to flip it a little bit and say for a freelancer, often success is getting the job mm -hmm. and then you just fail. <laughs> You hope you fail well, but you fail. It's like, oh, I've got the chance to write this, you know, fill in the blank. I've got a chance to work in Undermountain. I'm going to write an Undermountain adventure that's going to be published by Wizards. I've succeeded, and now I get to go fail. <laughs> and and so you fail as, as well as you possibly can and hope that people enjoy the the imperfect thing that you've created because there is no such thing as a perfect product this or that so then you go off and you hopefully succeed at getting the next chance to fail yeah. uh, and yeah, that's I, sort of what art is like right it's 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 failing forward it's it's yep. failing better there's a, there's a lot of learning at every stage mm -hmm. for sure that uh brings up nightmarish quotes from people in my regular day job which is the software industry which you're mm -hmm. again failing forward and move fast and break stuff, which are kind of just garbage terms, right? It's really just about doing yeah. the best you can all the time and learning while you're doing it. Yeah. I always go back to, there's a Samuel Beckett quote, uh, ever tried, ever failed, try again, fail again, fail better. And for me, that's art, right? It's just failing better over and over and over again. But you have to take the small victories when you get them or the large victories uh, as they come, I guess. So yeah, yeah. good times. Those keep uh, us going. It does. It does. It keeps us on our toes or flat on our back, depending on uh, the stage of the project you're at. <laughs> yeah. And our second question comes in from Torin McCabe via YouTube. Uh, we were talking about world building and Torin says, wow, Sean's thought process is completely different than mine. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Um, <laughs> My first and best bit of advice on world building is to say how your world is like this other world, only with these couple of things changed. And I'm going to start by saying there's absolute torn. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is a fine way to to create using templates, modeling based on other things. They are great learning tools. They're very efficient. They're very effective ways to create. A uh, great way to build a world, especially if it's one that you're just dealing with with your home group. Mm -hmm. However, I would not use that as the best way to describe a world if you plan to market it or publish it. Because what you are saying is, it's just like this world with these two changes. There are very smart people out there, very creative people, and a lot of them DM. And if you say, buy my world, it's like Eberron, except the dragon marked houses are... are uh, Crime syndicates and the Warforged are all ruthless assassins. That sounds great. And then I'm going to say as the DM, you know, I can already do that. I can just do make these tweaks. So you sort of need to build the world from the ground up, at least uh, on paper, if you're going to market and sell your world to a wider audience, I think. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, that's the sharpest distinction to me is is what are you building it for? Because if you're building something for a home game, you have a lot more leeway to, you know, just sand serial numbers off and uh, and tweak things to your liking flavor, you know, take bits yeah. from here and there, whatever. Um, but if you're actually going to try to market something for sale to a wider audience, you have to make sure that it's distinct enough from whatever you're emulating. And it's fine to be influenced by things. You can take elements that you like about Eberron and those can influence whatever you're building for your, you know, magic punk world that you, uh, that, that mm -hmm. you want to make. Um, but it really needs to be yours. And you can also get into legal trouble depending on how closely you cleave and how many things. I would recommend changing more than two details <laughs> if you're yeah. going to try to do something like that. For sure. Yeah, I love the way you explain that, Sean. I think um, to put a to bow on it, I would say building the world needs to be a process of self-expression, like not, not derivative necessarily, because that's more fulfilling in my mind. Uh, explaining a world is often, here are the three things you need to know. 
because uh, you're not going to read everything I wrote, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I there's nothing more disappointing than sitting down writing a hundred pages about a, a a fantasy world or a sci-fi world or what have you, and then realizing after the fact that your players don't care. They want to know how do I jump in and start playing, and how do I make a character that's going to be fun for me to play. Mm -hmm. And so you need to put in the the amount of work for world building that's fun for you, and not expect anyone else is ever going to see that or care about it the way you do unless you're publishing and then it's a whole different <laughs> whole different conversation you have to make it marketable yeah one of the greatest things i've seen in setting books or setting guides is that you know 10 important things you need to know about blank and so you you're not saying it's like this but not you were saying it is this it is this and even if you're using another world as a template, if you say that you are denying yourself, that's not denying yourself. It's training yourself not to talk in terms of other things when it isn't, but in terms of what it is. And that can be super important. This, you know, this world has rampaging dragons. Lots of worlds have rampaging dragons, but by saying, well, it's like dragon Lance, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Just say you you have rampaging dragons and, and uh, you'll serve yourself better. By starting with the comparison, you're, you're denying your own world's creation the ability to be its own thing. You're sort of already boxing it in as, you know, ever on light or whatever. Um, just instead of saying that, say magical technology is prevalent and mm -hmm. then go from there and you can have dozens hundreds infinite number of different D, D worlds that use magical technology but do it in ways different from each other yeah yeah i like so, you guys were talking a lot about shadow dark on the show lately and they could have made the misstep of saying it's like 5e light because mm -hmm. it really kind of is there's some new stuff in there for sure but if you're mm -hmm. walking up to a player and saying hey we're gonna play this shadow dark game it's a little bit like 5e light and a little more fatal that would probably get the point across to most players but that's not how Shadow Dark's going to explain Shadow Dark, right? right. That, that would be a huge mistake because yeah, it is. That, that's a good than, thing. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So thank you for those questions and thank you for those answers. Let's talk a little bit about some news. And the big news that hit my inbox uh, at the end of last week was Modifius announcing a Discworld role playing game. Uh, it has licensed Discworld for a series of board games. But they are also going to publish a tabletop role-playing game called Terry Pratchett's, Pratchett's Discworld Adventures in Ankh Morpork, with a Kickstarter coming uh, later in 2024. They did not give any details about what kind of rules they are going to use for this game. They are obviously well known for their 2D20 system, but who knows what if they're going to use that or move on to something else. Uh, do you either of you know Discworld, like Discworld, hate Discworld? I'm aware of it. Uh, I haven't read um, the the Discworld stuff, unfortunately. It's sort of on my list, but something I um, was never exposed to uh, mm -hmm. early on in life. It just it just never never crossed my path uh, until later. Um, I have some friends who are doing loop de loops ever mm -hmm. since this uh, <laughs> this announcement dropped. So. Uh, Kelly's going to be real excited. Have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in exactly the same boat. I am aware of Discworld. I don't know if I was too early or too late in my uh, adopting a fantasy and sci-fi as my my go-to settings, because I think it kind of blends the two, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. It's a little sci-fi fantasy-ish, yeah. um, in, at least how it's been explained to me. Um, it is moving up my list by based on the amount of excitement I'm seeing in all the Discord channels I'm in. This seems like something yeah. that I'm super, super jazzed about. Yeah, I, I've read I, excerpts and I've seen a bit of the, uh, the what is it? That was a live action sort of British production of, of some of the some of the Terry Pratchett stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, they've had a few, especially British BBC uh, adaptations. Uh, yeah, I read my first the first Discworld book. I, it was either the Light Fantastic or Sorcery, and I read it in high school based on the recommendation of a game playing friend. And it was the perfect, for my taste at that time, blending of satire and fantasy. Mm. It, awesome. was, it, it was it uh, was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but fantasy. 
Yeah. And it just struck the exact right chord at the exact right time. And I read as many of them as I could get my hands on. And he came out with a more children focused uh, series, uh, the Tiffany Aching series. Mm. Uh, there was the We Free Men, Hatful of Sky, and, and maybe four or five in the in the in the series, more uh, focused towards children. So I read those to my daughter. Of course, it was for her. It wasn't for me. It was for her. Uh, but and they're even though they're more young adult children's focused, they're still witty and insightful and all yeah. of the things that that I love about literature and games and fantasy. Uh, so when I saw this, my first thought was, oh, cool. And my second thought was, I don't know if I want to play this game. And I sure as hell don't want to design this game. <laughs> because yeah that's it's, daunting yeah it's it's so it's so good in the medium that it's in that trying to make a funny game mm. is so difficult trying to make a super witty game is so difficult uh and the world is still cool and fun and funny and satirical and in all the best ways I just don't know how it's going to translate to a role playing game. Yeah. 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 One yeah. of the great things about reading satire and cleverly written things is that it's controlled. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like watching a great comedy sketch. It yeah. is when it's performed well, it is the perfect thing. And then you put it at your table and hope it goes well. And then you realize your players are your players and mm -hmm. they're going to do what they're going to do. They're ne not necessarily going to play witty and satirical. They're not going to embrace that world. And then it, even if it's a really well-made game, it might just not feel right when you start playing it. And even in its own medium, satire can be very hit or miss. I mean, just look at the res the resurgence of the discourse around Starship Troopers and things like Warhammer 40k, and if they are good satire or if they have missed the mark of satire and are harboring nastiness and humanity in their spaces. So mm -hmm. yeah, you have to tread carefully when you're dealing with things like, well, this needs a certain amount of media literacy, or you have to get it to, to get the message. It's actually bringing across and then when you translate that to a game what sort of mechanics are going to be happening that incentivize you to certain avenues of play and yeah there's a whole lot to consider there and i'm interested to see what they do with it i would yeah. i would say sean remember you said success in this industry is really about getting hired for the project though so if they yeah. call i expect you to say yes and then make a game <laughs> that you're not proud of as you said you you, you failed right <sighs> This is the one thing where I would probably go, oh, I, I, I just, I can't, I couldn't, I could do it. I mean, Acquisitions Incorporated was one thing that was fun, funny, but it didn't have the sort of gravitas behind it that, that this does. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I wish whoever works on it, wish them well. Um, especially if you're going to be designing a new rule system to go with it. Um, if you're using 2D20, then you can, you've got that. We'll talk about this later. You've got that solid base there. Uh, yeah. Trying to make your, and then you, if you're going to have board games with it, you may want to tie that to a board game and the wheels go round and round and my brain is already go is already having, <laughs> I'm having anxiety literally right now and I'm not even working on the game. So, yeah. uh, more power to them. Speaking of new games, uh, Daggerheart, the Critical Daggerheart. Role. Yeah, the Critical Role. Uh, what's the company that Critical Role? Uh, Darrington Press. Thank you. Darrington Press will be publishing Daggerheart, and you can play it starting March 12th in the open beta. Uh, you can find everything you need to know about this playtest at daggerheart.com. There's going to be a few different ways to do this. One will be go to the Daggerheart website where you can get the PDF material that you need. Um, you can print it if you need to. You can also go to partners of Darrington Press and Daggerheart, Demiplane, which will have a character creator via their Nexus, or Drive Through RPG, where you can get the role playing game material. Have either of you read anything about this? Play tested? Previously, they, they've discussed the hope and fear dice that they're going to have and a card system for creating your character. Uh, any 
experience thoughts only the the vaguest sort of discussion and people posting on social media that they happen to be at a like a con event where you could jump into these sort of early play tests where you know one of the designers was there running something mm -hmm. um so i don't know a whole much uh, a whole great deal about it yet um i'm interested to see what it does and how it works mm -hmm. Yeah, I have very little exposure. Only what I've read over the last few days. Uh, think you know when they when they announced that, I went and looked, and I was like, oh, I didn't realize this was this far along. Um, and I heard on Elders Lorecast that this was happening, so I went and did some digging, and uh, I I'm intrigued. I so I love the math of games, and I know they're using a two D twelve system, and I'm like, okay, let's see, is that going to be actually mathematically interesting, or is it just you're rolling D twelves on tables or something like that? So mm -hmm. I'm interested to play a little bit of the playtest materials and see what they're doing with that more than anything else. Yeah, it's it's the the if I remember correctly from when we covered it a long time ago, it's each of the D twelves represent the different thing one represents hope and one represents fear so if you succeed on the hope side you still succeed but it means something if you succeed on the fear side it means something and i'm i'm intrigued by melding mechanics with narrative elements yeah. rather than just have okay you succeed so therefore the story moves forward as opposed to you succeed in a certain way or the way you succeeded also speaks to something on the narrative side of of either your character's psyche or how the how the uh, success is perceived by others or you know those sorts of things and i'm so intrigued by that but like you say jason the math needs to work yeah and if it's just that if it's just okay hope though therefore you you tell me something hopeful but the math underneath it doesn't work it's 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 again anxiety as game designer yeah it, for me it puts me in mind of the genesis system the one that was used for star wars edge of the empire with their you know uh, all, all their different little sort of axes on their special dice that can mean different things where you fail but you get this good mm -hmm. thing that happens even though you failed that sort of thing yeah my experience with playing it while fairly limited so you know just take that in mind um is that that seems challenging to be able to sort of adjudicate all of the different things that can mean for every role that happens for every session of a campaign that could last you know how long um so that's that's my big curiosity is how well will this hope and fear and what do these different sorts of success or failure mean and how easily is that communicated to the the GM and the players? And how easy is that to do something with, to to weave it in and make it be a thing? Uh, or is it something that is just more often than not going to be left behind in favor of, well, I rolled and succeeded or I rolled and failed, we move on? Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of what you do with some of the Powered by the Apocalypse games where you succeed mm -hmm. with a consequence. and. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. consequences are written very generically. You know, it, you succeed at some sort of cost yeah. or you put yourself in a bad right. situation or something like that. And that leaves a lot of room for interesting story. But as a narrator, as a storyteller, you have to be quick on your feet. That's a lot of load. That's a lot of yeah. cognitive load. Uh, Blades of... in the Dark does similar stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm wondering when they're writing the books for Daggerheart, are they doing enough coaching to make it fun exciting yeah. and really interesting or unique or is it going to be left up to the again left up to the table and you, it gets left behind as you said dan yeah. yeah guidance and tools could go a long way here i'm interested yeah. to see what they put together yeah it's when you think about designing a game often you have in your mind as the game master like the best game master you ever had right it's like oh this game master who's great they will be great at running this game and you never or you often forget to write a game that the worst game master you ever had will be able to run yeah. and that's what we're talking about here right it's like i i sat down with my family to run the star wars game and i'm a I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a great game master, but I'm an experienced game master. So I was like, okay, here we go. Roll the dice. And it, as Dan said, it comes up with, oh, you failed horribly, but you had a great breakthrough. Triumph it's, or whatever. Yeah. It's like, okay, let, how? there's only so many times where you can either succeed wildly, but have a, you know, have a drawback or fail horribly, but have a triumph that you just run out of 
run out of story. Beats. That's exactly it. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So that, as you said, Dan, cognitive load gets gets quite extreme while you're trying to to do it. Yeah. So it, it and the card based system also intrigued me. I don't know. I assume that you were aware of fourth edition, even if you didn't play it. Uh, but people loved cards. They loved to print out their own little power cards. They loved to buy power cards. Uh, so that was something that that people seem to like. And this game seems to be at least leaning into that a bit with card based character building, like backgrounds and, and things you can place on. Uh any thoughts on that or how they're going to use that? Uh, it's intriguing. Uh, and I've always been kind of enamored of card-based character creation mechanics ever since mm -hmm. Deadlands. I love Deadlands and I love how you make characters in that game. You use a poker deck, your regular deck of playing cards. You draw a number of cards and the, the suits and values determine, determine your statistics. And it's so cool. Um, uh and yeah so I, I just don't know how they're employing the cards yet mm -hmm. um you know fourth edition used them not as like a core mechanic but as a companion tool right. right uh so that's that's a different way to approach it whereas you know in deadlands when you roll initiative the marshal <laughs> shuffles a deck and you get a card based on how well you drew or a number of cards and then that determines your order in the round by the yeah. the value of the card yeah, so in my mind, the cards are going to be great as long as they actually become a compelling component, not just something you could have done as part of the die roll. So mm -hmm. they need to be a necessary addition or, or, or influential in some way that the dice couldn't also do. In the, you know, is it, is it just adding complexity for complexity's sake? Because I guess mm -hmm. would be my problem. Yeah. The 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 problem that you could run into there is that becomes a. Um a potential barrier right uh that was an issue i had a lot of players run into with the genesis dice the star wars dice they needed to buy these bespoke dice they couldn't use any of their or they they could but it was a pain to have like a translation <laughs> matrix mm -hmm. for your d8 and what symbols the numbers would have that you know right. uh, that, that just doesn't work as well uh so it depends on what the cards are what's on them um do you want to them to be able to be reproduced with dice in a pinch if people don't have access to those cards um you know but then like what's the point of cards if it's just essentially rolling on a table so yeah, yeah. execution is going to be a big one here mm -hmm. yeah my big question about this release was what could it mean for D D? for fans of D&D, &D, for the market of D&D, &D, if Daggerheart's super successful. Because I know there is a non, um, you cannot dismiss out of hand the number of people that are into D&D &D because of Critical Role. It is, it's not 50%, but it's not 5% either, right? And so what kind of impact does this have, do you think? Yeah, I, my, my thought is as popular as Critical Role was, as many people as it brought to the game, uh, there is still a much larger percentage of D&D players out there who have no idea what Critical Role is. And so I hope it does well, and I hope it brings people into the hobby for the sake of the hobby as a whole. Um, but even, I think, if it is wildly successful in its own right, it's not a... It doesn't tip the, the market much in terms of 5th edition D&D or... 2024 edition of DD. &D. Uh, yeah, I, I'd agree with that assessment. Um, Critical Role, it wildly popular. If Daggerheart kind of follows that that success model, that's fantastic. And I, I really hope it does. I, I wish huge success for everybody who works on it because more games, more better. Um, but just given some of the things I've seen both observing as a fan and from my time in Minas Renton, uh, it, I don't think the impact will be that significant on D and D itself as sort of a, a, a business or, or fan base factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It kind of feels to me like it will maybe bring even more people to D and D if it goes well, because they'll see there's the bigger world out there of role-playing games. It's not just, yeah, it, it'll, it'll you know, like, like both of you said, bring people into the hobby and that's all to the good and yeah. go, go play lots of games. Find, right. find what you love, play those. Yeah. Uh, this is such a niche hobby. 
even mm. as it's grown exponentially yeah. in the last five years or 10 years or 15 years, uh, it's still a niche hobby. And we, I'm always looking who's going to be the on-ramp, what's going to be the on-ramp yeah. for, for new players. And it's, it, that, that means advertising. That means, you know, cultural cachet. Yeah. It means a lot of things. And I would be, I would love it if it wasn't just Wizards of the Coast slash Hasbro who had to bear that burden of bringing people into the hobby. I would love it if some really huge, you know, powerful force in the industry, in, in culture, in business was able to bring new people in as well. I think that would be great. I just don't know if Critical Role, as large and wonderful as it is, is, is even enough to move the needle in, in that way. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at how big gaming has gotten and it's like as far as the entertainment industry, tabletop gaming is still just a rounding error. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sadly, yeah. but true. Yeah. Uh, but what's not an error is the D&D &D dev update that we saw yeah. come out recently where we learned about new features for the D&D &D Beyond maps. Very excited about this. Oh, yeah. Uh, what did we get? First of all, maps. I love maps. Uh, maps is the thing that I wanted 20 years ago. Just to put a map up and to move things on the map and let my friends move things on the map so we could play from a distance without having to get a master's degree in computer science. And uh, so th that came out to pretty, pretty popular reviews, pretty good reviews. And now they're updating things, including new draw and pointer features. So you can draw on the maps or put pointers on the map. Um, they already have Fog of War, but they are updating it to make it easier to use. There will be yeah. a spectator view, so you can see what the other people that you're playing with are seeing as, as the Game Master. They've updated tokens. They've added more maps. They talked about the new third-party release, Humblewood. Uh, so we, we've reported on that a couple of times, so that's available. And you can watch that dev update on YouTube following the link in our show notes. Uh, thoughts on maps and, and how you've used it or or what you think of it? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was say, I, I have used D&D &D Beyond for about three years now, COVID, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I have really liked the character creation aspects. I like being able to reference the things that I have bought in there and use those rules. There, It has some issues in my mind, but it is a very solid platform. I have never used maps. I, I didn't know this existed until we put it, until Sean told me about it a week ago, right? It, it was, oh, they have a map thing on there. And mm -hmm. so I need to play with it. I'm excited to give it a try. Unfortunately, my only standing D and D game is in person, mm -hmm. no electronics. We are paper and dice and it, which has been great. It's been a great throwback to, you know, being in high school and college, but uh, it means I don't get to play with D and D beyond anymore. And my subscription is going to waste, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> yeah uh so i've been using it uh i've been running turn of fortune's wheel and using maps uh for it and it's freaking fantastic it like it's what i want in a in a virtual tabletop it's very simple it's very clean it's very intuitive i could just pick it up and go um it's missing a couple of features that i need for it to feel like I've got it. This is what I want. And this is what I'm going to run campaigns in. It's almost there. Adding draw and pointers and some of the quality of life stuff with tokens helps. So like now I can take a token, uh, rename it to something. I Like what I really want is map pins. I want to be able to like, here's a point of interest. And now I can do that by renaming a generic token, right? Mm. Um, the draw, the draw function is great. So I can, oh, you put spike growth down. Here it is, right? Um, so feeding from that, I want area effect draw tools. I want to be able to just be like, here's a 20 foot sphere, whatever. Right. Uh, once you have that as a tool that you can just kind of drag and drop or, or click and drag to, to, you know, spread and angle around to see what the cone hits, then in my mind, it's going to be perfect. And, and that's everything I need. I don't need all the hyper extra bells and whistles that various platforms are doing which again i wish them all the success in the world for their audience that wants that stuff but that audience is not me <laughs> mm -hmm. are they are they 2d only right now 
maps on yeah know. maps is 2d oh, yeah. maps is yeah. 2d and, and that's that's another interesting thing is right it's we're getting maps but we're also at least theoretically getting a 3d virtual tabletop uh, yeah, that, that is, is being... called code name sigil or sigil mm -hmm. however you want to say it ah and and it's you know it's it's in tandem not in tandem but maybe separately it seems like almost being they're not the same thing yeah so yeah. Yeah. uh i i'm happy with that because yeah. there are people Me that too. just want the the 2d there are people that are going to want the 3d um so i'm glad that we we're getting these tools uh in in whatever way we want to use them yeah, yeah. I will tell you, I will move on to this. If you, one of you can tell me that on a token, you can tell me, uh, you can label it how many feet in the air it is. <laughs> Fly, flying I, I haven't played with the um, re like you can change its name. So if you want, you could just add the elevation as a, right. as in like a, an, a suffix on the end, you know? Yeah. <laughs> huh? This is a very salient point for me. We were in a, a baby red dragon's lair with our low gotcha. level characters. And uh, it was all over the place height wise and no one could figure it out. And I was like, all right, there's gotta be a tool for this somewhere. <laughs> got it. Now you know. Got it. Yeah. Now you know. Yeah, there's all kinds of risers and stuff for when you're playing on a tabletop, but yeah. yeah. You need to make a small dog, uh put a or cat, put a dragon suit on it and just set it on the table. Uh, my yeah. dog is a rask size if we're using regular uh, miniature. Okay. Awesome. A little, little too big. I was gonna say how, Archie, <laughs> would, would Archie wear a uh yeah, I could probably put some wings on Archie. And... All right, there you go. <laughs> so check that news out on the D&D uh, &D Dev Update. And last but not least, for our Creator Corner, we are going to talk about something near and dear to our hearts. We are going to talk about Surviving Strange Hollow, which heads to Kickstarter on Tuesday, March 5th, which means due to the magic of podcast time, it's tomorrow, but it's also yesterday or even sooner. Uh, but by the time you hear this, it will be up, it will have launched, and you can check it out at get.accidentalcyclops.com or just go to the Kickstarter. Uh, yeah. Very excited about this. Jason is uh, on the team that is the publisher. Dan is going to be a rules designer on this book. I am going to try not to fail too, too much uh, in my parts. And you know, very very excited to to uh, to show you more as this Kickstarter progresses. Uh, any quick uh, notes, Jason, on uh, on that? Yeah, we're just my my business partner and I are just very lucky to have gotten you two, but also the other you know amazing designers and writers on this project. Uh, we're, we're approaching it in a different way. I think it's going to allow everyone who's on the team to shine in their own ways. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. people people that are specialized in say writing fiction, we've got fiction to be written in this project that's going to be really stellar we're leading with the art emily Hare was the artist we had 95 percent of the artwork for the book done before we started imagining any rules or stories which is just really crazy from a publishing standpoint you never have that so uh we're really yeah, usually, usually goes the other way right yeah. and then you have this weird process where you have to go back and change words to fit art because it's at, at a certain point, you can't really change the art anymore. Yeah. So uh, the, I'm, I'm excited to design things to spec for the art that already exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, we kicked around a bunch of ideas that are, you know, pre, 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 pre design, I would say. And, and yeah. Dan's going to tell us how bad they are and make them all way better, uh, which is going to be great fun. Uh, Sean uh, and his team, Sean's the lead designer and his team are going to be writing a lot of fiction, but also wrapping that fiction into some of the the game design, which is going to be just, I think, a ton of fun to, to watch. Oh, yeah. yeah.